So um, I am Robert Newton. I'm an assistant, good Lord, associate professor at the Pennington Biomedical Research Center. Anybody heard of Pennington before? Yeah. Raise your hand. Anybody been to Pennington before? No, oh, well, oh, great. Um, so I'm an associate professor for eight more days, and then I will uh, be a full professor. So very, very happy about that. Thank you. All right, so we're going to talk about, we're going to, we're going to talk about an intervention. So you guys heard a lot about uh, epi studies. We're going to talk about an intervention that we did down in uh, Baton Rouge. And this is my co-investigator, Dr. Owen Carmichael. He does all the imaging um, investigations. And the uh, program that we're going to talk about is a program for African-American cognition and exercise. That's uh, PACE. Is, is the program that we're going to talk about. So you guys have heard a lot about the background, about the percentages and the prevalence incidence of Alzheimer's disease and dementia in African Americans, so I'm not going to review that. What I will say is that there are very few interventions that had been done, physical activity interventions that had been done in African Americans looking at cognitive outcomes. And so there's probably about, what, five, maybe six labs across the United States that have, are doing this work. Um, Mark's lab is one of them. Our lab is another one. And there's been some findings in the literature that there's differential outcomes between individuals who identify as African Americans and individuals who identify as non-African Americans in terms of the effect of exercise on the body. Um, so that's one of the reasons why we did uh, the study. And so the PACE study really was designed to achieve three different aims. We wanted to tailor an intervention. We wanted to assess the effect of it on physical activity and then look at the effects of the physical activity intervention on cognition in older African-American adults. So the first thing that we did was we did focus groups. We went to the community and we asked the community a bunch of questions about what do you know about Alzheimer's disease? What do you think are some of the causes? What would be interventions that you would be willing to um, partake in? And what measurements would you do? Okay. So we conducted four focus groups. There was 51 older African Americans who participated. It's the average age is about 68 and majority female, which is fairly common for uh, these kinds of studies. And so here you can see um, Leah Carter here, who's getting her PhD at LSU. She conducted many of the focus groups. And then we have Erica Pugh, who is a postdoctoral fellow um, this year, and she um, helped to write up the results of this study. And you can see the characteristics of the four focus groups that we did down here. Okay, so we looked at the themes, we did focus groups, we looked at the themes, and we found that many African Americans knew about Alzheimer's disease and were very concerned about it, feeling that they were susceptible to it because they had a family member or somebody that they knew. They were willing to do many different sorts of interventions, so if dietary intervention, physical activity intervention, combination, and they were willing to do many different measurements in terms of what they would be willing to do, and you know, cognitive assessments and blood draws and things of that nature. So by a show of hands, how many of you believe that our population was willing to do a cerebral spinal tap, a lumbar puncture to get the CSF fluid? How many people think that there were members? Raise your hands up high. Way high. You guys are all wrong. <laughs> Every single person that we asked said no to doing a CSF. Okay. Okay. Well, that, you may be right about that, Dr. Hugh, and your, your talk is going to change the way that we ask this question in the future. But when we asked, nobody was willing to do it. But they were willing to do MRIs and PETs and blood draws and cognitive testing. So that informed the design of this intervention as well as the ones that we got uh, funded subsequently. So this was a randomized clinical trial. Um, it was an intervention versus a control. We recruited 56 individuals into the intervention or into the trial. It was a 12-week trial. It was run by uh, Callie Bear here, who is our study coordinator for this study and our subsequent ones. And all of our sessions were run by staff at Pennington. Okay, so we did not go and, and recruit people from the community, you know, um, you know, community health workers or anything like that. It was all done uh, in-house. Okay, so our intervention, this is Adam Lowe. This is the lead for our intervention group. And you can see here the characteristics of the intervention. So they came to the YMCA. So this was a community-based intervention. It was done, at least the intervention was 
in the community. Two days out of the week, where they came, they did uh, flexibility, balance, strength, and aerobic activity over 90 to um, 120 minutes over those two sessions. They were about 45 to 60 minutes per session. And then we asked them to do physical activity at home on their own. Okay, so we gave them a prescription card and we told them, or encouraged them to do 30 minutes of aerobic activity. And then they had a prescription for the strength that they were supposed to be doing and it was progressive. So they had, to, they had different levels that they could do the strength training. And so they had to progress to the highest levels. So the total activity that we wanted them to do um, was about 30 to 45 minutes, but 30 minutes of that needed to be aerobic activity, okay? So for these essentially two to three days out of the week, depending on how much activity they did during the group sessions. All right, so then we had our successful agent group, which was the control group, and it was led by Shalita Donato here. And these sessions were once a week. They were conducted at Pennington Biomedical, and they talked about a range of different topics. And it was sort of rolling recruitment, um, rolling in enrollment, so anybody could come in at any time and they would get the 12 sessions and they would get all the information. So you can see some of the topics that we had here which were relevant for an older population. Uh, budgeting, voting scams, falls, nutrition, sleep, you know, the, these kinds of categories. And so these were hour-long sessions. And the measures that we'll talk about today, we took more measures than what's here on the screen, but um, I'm only going to talk about these today. So we, obviously, being a physical activity study, we assessed physical activity. Um, these are the objective measures. So we had accelerometers on our participants at baseline. And then we also had, they did it at the 12-week assessment. And then for those who are in the intervention group, they wore Fitbits for the entire duration of the study, for the full 12 weeks, okay? The individuals who were in the control group did not have the Fitbits during this, this time of the study. So we weren't able to compare Fitbit data between the two. Then in terms of the cognitive assessment, we did the R bands. And you can see the five different categories that are assessed with the R bands. You have immediate memory, delayed memory, uh, visual spatial function, language capacity, attention, and then there was a global cognitive function score, which was basically a composite of all of the uh, subscales. Okay. So, this is a very busy chart, so I'm going to highlight certain things here for you. So, this was our population. I guess what I should say is to give you the um, inclusion criteria. So, we were looking for African Americans who were older than 60, or 65 to 85. And they needed to be sedentary, which meant they were not engaged in any sort of regular physical activity. They had to be... They had their blood pressure needed to be under control, diabetes needed to be under control, but you could have elevated blood pressure and elevated glucose. It just needed to be um, medically managed or under control. Um, and so that was our population that we were trying to recruit. And they had to be normal cognitive function. That's another uh, key characteristic. So as you can see here, the average age uh, was about 69, so they were at the lower end of the age range. It was primarily female, so it was 73% female, which is, again, very typical for these kinds of studies. The BMI was 32, so they would be classified as obese. And as you can see, and I think we heard this earlier today, that um, so we had a highly educated sample. So 50% either had a college degree or post-college degree, okay? So again, highly educated sample. At the accelerometer, they were taking about 3,600 steps a day, which is fairly low, which again says that we were able to uh, recruit this sedentary population. And then they were getting about average of six minutes a day of moderate to vigorous physical activity. Okay, and so we all know that the recommendation is to be doing 30, so if you're only getting six, you are well below uh, that level of physical activity. Okay, so let's get into some of the uh, results. And here what you can see is the step count data from the accelerometer, okay? Now remember we have both accelerometer and Fitbit. This is the accelerometer data. So they, again, they wore the accelerometer at baseline. They wore it at 12 weeks. You can see these are the step counts. And this is our successful aging group, which is a control group. And you can see that it, essentially there was no change in physical activity for those in the successful aging group. And you can see that those who are in the physical activity intervention, that they actually increased their steps a little over a thousand steps per day from baseline to the 12 week assessment. Okay, So this would suggest that at least at some level that our physical activity intervention actually increased physical activity. 
And then here you can see, uh, again, a busy chart, but let me highlight. And the reason why this chart is busy is because we did the data analysis using three different levels of physical activity. So some that were more tailored towards an older population. But if you look at the uh, 1952 cut point, which is what you'll see in most of the data that's like NHANES, where they're looking at levels of physical activity, you can see that here, this is our physical activity group. And you will see that there was a six minute increase in physical activity for those who were in the physical activity group and then the intervention group. And then you can see that over here that there was really no increase. Well, here's the change. There was really no change in physical activity for those who were in the successful aging group. Okay. So again, it looks like there was an increase in physical activity. And this is again, this is the accelerometer data. So then as we look at the Fitbit data, and remember that this was only on those individuals who were in the intervention, you can see that there was an increase in steps up until about week five, and then there was sort of a leveling out from week five to 12. And so this makes sense given that we were trying to ramp people up gradually to 30 minutes a day, and then um, hoping that they would maintain that over the course of the intervention. So then the other thing that we decided to do was to look at how much physical activity are people doing when they're in the group sessions versus how much when they're at home? Because that's important. Because remember, our, our intervention was not all being done in a, in, a, in a structured environment. We asked people to do physical activity on their own. So on the days when they had no, they were self-reported, no physical activity, you can see that they were getting about 5,000 steps. And this is with the Fitbit, okay? Which, is about the amount of physical activity that you saw at baseline with the Fitbit. Then when they're at home, we're asking them to do 30 minutes of physical activity, and so they're getting about 6,600 steps or so when they're at home. But you can see that when they're in the group sessions, they're getting almost 1,000 steps more than when they're at home, okay? So we suggest that we need to do something here. We need to have a better way of increasing physical activity when they're at home. And then other data to support this, this is the moderate to rigorous physical activity. This is time, how many minutes they did of moderate to rigorous physical activity with the accelerometer. And again, when people are uh, reporting to activity is the lowest amount of activity. And then when they're at home, they're getting just over 22. Remember that we asked them to do 30 minutes of moderate to rigorous physical activity when they were at home. So they missed that mark a little bit. And then when they're in the group sessions, they're doing over 35 minutes of physical activity. And these are significantly different from each other. So there is some uh, differences there. Then if we look at their self-reported uh, days of activity, they did three, uh, just over three days of uh, physical activity or reported no days of uh, activity for three days. Two and a half days of home-based, which makes sense given that we asked them to do two to three days, and then they were doing about two days of group sessions. Okay, so then the cognitive outcomes. And this is Katie Guizdala, this was our postdoc who um, analyzed this data. And here are all of the subdomains of the R bands. You can see that um, everything is well within normal because the mean is 100 and the standard deviation is 15. So we did get a population that was normal functioning. So let's look at the data. Okay, so on your Y axis you have the change in R bands and on the bottom is all your subscales. This is the physical, like this is the, this is the successful aging group, okay? So you can see that there are increases in each of the subscales of the successful aging group. So what do you all think would happen with the exercise group? Any guesses? Anybody read the paper? Oh, dang. <laughs> so what happened with the, with the physical activity group is despite the fact that there were increases in physical activity, there were not increases in cognitive function. Okay, so you can see these bars are much lower than the ones that are for the uh, successful aging group, okay? And then there were significant differences for immediate and delayed memory, and then for the visual, visual spatial function, you can see that there's a significant difference there, all with the, physical act, the successful aging group doing better. Uh, significantly in moderate to uh, small to moderate uh, effect sizes there. And then if you look at global, it's no surprise that the global function is going to, um, was significantly different at 12 weeks between the two groups and there was a within group change increase in cognitive function for those who are in the successful aging group. 
So, uh, and again, uh, you know, the same similar sort of effect size. So, let's look at, um, oh, I should say this. We have good attendance. So you can see 86% for the successful agent group, 93% for the uh, physical activity group, and then, oh, I'm sorry. I thought there was another chart here. But what you can, this is participant satisfaction. So we asked both groups, how satisfied were you with either group that you, you received? And you can see that if you look at the maximum here, the maximum score being the best score that you can give, you can see that all these scores nearly max out, 23, 25, 19, 20, 14, 15, and 4.9 to 5. So everybody was very satisfied with the group that they were randomized into. Okay, so conclusions. Um, we resulted in greater physical activity, but it didn't have an effect on cognitive function. We think what was going on with the successful aging group was that Shalita basically messed up. Okay, so she did too good of a job of getting people to talk amongst each other. And to what we believe happened was that she she was able to get people to make small changes. Because if you're talking about sleep and you're talking about nutrition, you're talking about physical activity, you're talking about social engagement, and you're actually in a group talking and, and being social, we think that those things, there might have been sub-clinical changes to those things. You put all those together, then you get some of the changes that we're, we, we saw in the study. So that's what we think was uh, the major cause of uh, the differences. And so future directions, we're, we have other data that we're going to continue to analyze in terms of physical function, telomeres, sleep. We have some biomarkers that we're going to look at. Um, we have um, translated these findings into two federally funded grants that we are currently running, one for individuals with normal function and one for those who have MCI. And then we have started to do qualitative work to um, branch out into rural populations because, given their uh, disparities and that those populations experience other things that urban populations don't in terms of um, distance and travel to get to a site and some uh, pollutants and, and things of this nature. And then we're also uh, thinking about doing how to do multi-component uh, trials. So, special thanks to all those folks who helped out, um, our investigators and people who were running the groups and the different components at Pennington that allowed us to do a lot of these things and then the folks that you, were, that you already met. Okay, I'm out of time. <laughs> Any questions? I think this works. Oh, do you want the? I think we've got one for you and one for the audience. Hello, I'm Peyton from NYU. Um, I just have a quick question. I was wondering, did you have any like findings that may have suggested that the length of your study might be why physical activity didn't improve cognitive, uh, didn't improve any cognitive scores? Just only because I would think that it might be a little bit longer than just a couple months that might be necessary to show some real improvement. Just off of my dome, like I don't know. Yeah, I mean that's that's possible. There's been. Um a few studies that have been 12 weeks that have shown some changes, but it could be, it very well could be that it just takes a little bit longer for these effects, you know, for the physical activity to have an effect. And so we'll somewhat be able to see that because our current trials are a year long. So we'll be able to see if the physical activity uh, has a change in those trials. Yes? Um, I'm Shreya from Emory. I was just wondering, did you follow up with your participants like six months or a year later to see if they're continuing to adhere to the physical activity changes or sleep or anything like that? Yeah, so that we did not do. We, were not, we didn't have funding to follow those folks up, but um, that is a great idea and something we would love to do. Hi, I'm Kat Britt. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm at UPenn. And my question is, for the future studies that you're writing, uh, what will you do different for the control group this time, if you think that was the influence for the successful aging? Yeah, so we, before we got this data, we actually got those other trials funded. <laughs> so what we did in the two larger trials is this an active control group. So they're going to get all the same sort of education, plus they get a little bit of physical activity. So yeah, I guess in some ways you could say we kind of shot ourselves in the foot because we made our control group better, but we'll see what happens over the course of a year. What would I do different if, so I think, um, I'm not sure I would do something different. I think um, you have to give your control group something to keep them engaged, and so um, 
education was something that they really liked. And it was about as, you know, inert as you can get. Great. Okay. Thank you All so right. much. Thank you. The microphone comes to me next.